Um, we have Senator Drew McEwen here today, who is a dedicated public servant with over 11 years of experience representing the 35th Legislative District. Okay, Drew was first elected in 2012. He spent a decade in the State House before transitioning to the Senate in 2023. Drew holds a pivotal role as the ranking Republican on the Senate Environment, Energy, and Technology Committee, where he takes on the big issues that affect us. He also serves on the committees of transportation, business and financial services, and labor and commerce. Before his political career, Senator McEwen served for six years in the U.S. Navy, including five patrols with the Navy's submarine from Bangor Naval Base Kitsap. Throughout his life, Senator McEwen has always sought to focus on what matters most, love of country, dedication to family, and service to community. Please welcome Senator McEwen. Thank you for having me here today, and I apologize if I sound stuffed up. I am. My allergies have gotten the best of me this weekend uh, with uh, with the pollen going on, so apologies for that. But uh, thank you for having me here today. And a lot of familiar faces, a couple of new ones, and some of you have heard this uh, this stump before. And so, uh, but for those that haven't, uh, we've got a profound opportunity to win this congressional seat for the first time since 1964, and. We've only had one Republican represent the 6th Congressional District, and that was in, uh, he left office in 65, and it's been a Democrat stronghold for the past few decades, and how are we gonna change that? What's gonna happen? And I'm gonna come back to that in a little bit, and I'll tell you how that does happen. But uh, real quick, my, uh, my background, my story, um, you know, came out here in uh, the mid-90s, uh, serving in the Navy, I was in the nuclear power program, did my submarine uh, duty here, and uh, just fell in love with this area, and it's, it's been home since. Um, and I got out, I was blessed uh, to, uh, to be in between Desert Storm and 9-11, uh, so there wasn't a lot going on in the world, there was stuff to get promoted, and that was one of the reasons I, I did move on, as a lot of us did during that time frame, but uh, very forever grateful for, the, for those lessons learned during that time frame. And uh, going to the business world, uh, my uncle recruited me to his firm, and. Uh, it was impeccable timing. Uh, two weeks before 9-11, I resigned and started my own company. And, and I bring that up because, to me, it's a testament of this country and what makes us great. I would never want to go through that again, but I refused to quit and just kept grinding it out in the wake of 9-11. And we all have our stories that, is, you know, how that affected us. But for me, it just it defined, okay, you're either, you're either going to succeed or you're not. And, and I chose to take the path of success with it. And it was not easy, uh, but uh, 23 years later, that company is still in business. So I'm very proud of that fact, and I still run that today as an investment manager. And you know, when we look around the world today, especially in our nation, you know, it's a constant, uh, what, can, what can government do for me? How can, how can government do something for me? And, and I think we just gotta go back to the founding of this nation and that it's what can we do for our nation, right? And that's so much more valuable as a, as a nation going for prosperity than, than the opposite of that equation. So fast forward though to 2012, and some folks in the Shelton business community, which is where I live, uh, asked me to run for the State House of Representatives. And the 35th district, which some of you are in, it's the third of uh, Kitsap County, you know, going out to Seabed. Basically it's from Silverdale, going all the way down to all of Mason County, and then in uh, Thurston County, all the way down to Rochester. It's a huge district, very rural. And but in 2012, you know, I, I get this ask to run, and and so I do, and a lot of it, uh, you know, I had the, the blessing of being somewhat naive on the on the political landscape because the state party and the House Republican Caucus, neither one of them recruited me. They both said, "Hey, thanks for running. You know, it's going to be tough. Uh, a Republican hasn't won it in forever," and that was true. But just ground it out, similar to what I had to do in 2001, and what happened. That, that election night in 2012, we were supposed to have one of the proverbial red waves, right? From Romney on down, everybody was, was projected to be winning. And let's be pragmatic, we got it handed to us, right? We did not perform very well, we didn't win the, the governor's mansion, we certainly didn't win the, the presidential side. Um, did not pick up very much in the, uh, the national legislature as well in Congress. But that night, I won. 
and it's the first time flipping a seat from Democrat to Republican for the first time since 1932. When, thank you, thank you, yes. When people tell you it can't happen, it can. And that was a monumental moment because that was also the night, so Norm Dix did not seek re-election, that was the night Derek Kilmer got elected to Congress. Um, and I bring that up because it ties into how is this race winnable? So that night, the, uh, the only other elected Republican in the state legislature was Jan Angel in the 26th district. The rest of it was all Democrat. I won that night, so now there was two of us. And fast forward to today, and what is the makeup within the 6th Congressional District? The 35th district, which is mine, completely Republican. The 19th district, which is where Jim Walsh uh, represents, Grays Harbor, completely Republican. It was completely Democrat that night. The 26th district is two out of three. The 31st, which is in Pierce County and covers part of the 6th Congressional District, completely Republican. That was not the landscape in 2012, but it is today. And why is that? What is changing? Um, again, I go back to 2012, and as I talk to people, it was just became more and more abundantly clear that you have these hardworking families that they voted Democrat. That was the party that they grew up in, that their parents and their grandparents had been in. But this party had gotten so progressively left that their voices were lost. But they didn't know they had another option. And, and I think sometimes as Republicans, we make these elections way more complicated than they need to be. We're so excited to tell you what you should think instead of just listening. And we've got to do more of that. And that is how we win. And it's just listening to them and finding out when you have common ground. And when you campaign on the things that you already agree with your neighbors on, it's a heck of a lot easier than trying to, because you're not going to convince somebody at the doorstep of an issue. You're not. That's just reality, right? So let's find out where we agree and then let's show them a path and how we can make those things happen. And that was a big part of why I won in 2012. And today we fast forward to with uh, Derek Kilmer announcing this past November he went to seek reelection that he's gonna retire at the end of this term. And it's the same thing. As I travel all over the Olympic Peninsula, we have six counties in this district, it's that same thing. Working class families have just been frankly left behind by a party that they, that they had known their whole life. And they're wondering where the heck do we go? And the more I talk with them, the more the excitement builds and the more opportunity that we see that's happening. We can win this. And, and I firmly believe that it doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but there is a path to victory in all this. Now, some of the top three issues that I hear about time and again, and there's always nuances of you know different things that come up for people, but the top three issues time and again are the economy. How is Bidenomics working out for you? <laughs> right? Have you had enough of that? I mean, inflation has destroyed family savings. In 2021, we saw, and I know this from uh, my, my investment business, and you look at these numbers. In 2021, family savings rates were at an all-time high, all-time high. Today, it's been depleted, and credit card debt is spiking when interest rates are now at a decade's high. Mm -hmm. That's what Bidenomics has done. The inflationary pressure has eroded family savings. They were able to weather the storm up until now, and now they're going to the credit card aspect to, uh, to get through. Inflation, when they, when they say inflation has, um, is cooling, well, when you had inflation for three years in a row at 8% and now it's at 4%, is that cooling? No, it's still going up, just not up at the same trajectory. And that is a big issue. And how, so a big part of that you know, is having a strong economy that families can provide for, their, for themselves. And that solves a lot of issues that uh, you know, puts uh, stresses on our, uh, on our overall economy when families have the ability to produce an income that takes care of them. The, the next big issue I hear time and again is immigration. Yeah. Have you had enough of the unsecured border? Yeah. Yeah. And it is literally killing our families. The fentanyl coming across the border is the biggest threat right now to the families in this, in this, uh, in this nation. And it is, it is an unchecked um, hazard that, uh, that is literally killing by the day. Um, and it starts to hit home when a good friend of mine whose uh, brother-in-law happened to go to the, the garage bar and grill uh, two years ago. Not a drug user, became in contact with fentanyl there, and he died. 
that's the reality. This is hitting home for people where, you know, whether somebody, you know, is, is a user or not, it is hitting home for families. And we have an administration that's turned a blind eye to this whole thing. We cannot, and I, listen, I'm all for immigration, legal immigration. It is what's built this nation, right? We've got to reform our laws, though, that allow for people that want to come and work here and potentially gain citizenship, that there's a path that's understandable, that's streamlined, that makes sense to be able to do that, and that we can vet them. But what do we have right now? We have an open border, north and south, and people are coming in unchecked, unfettered, and bringing with them the, the, the crime issues, the drug issues, and God knows what else. Because you know where we're seeing the largest spike of illegal immigration from? It's not the it's not the family from somewhere in Central America that's just trying to find a better way of life. That's not the threat. The percentage increase that we've had from China, yeah. Iran, Yemen, continue to go up. These are not our friendliest neighbors. I don't want another 9-11. And if we don't get our hands around it, we're gonna have a big problem. So the first, the first point in all that is we have to secure our borders before we even talk about addressing people that are here we can't even begin to do that until we secure our borders. We need to do that ASAP. And then finally, as you all know, we have one of the largest naval installations in the world in our backyard here. And it is a key component to our national security. And vital that we protect that. We, we think that we're immune from a BRAC commission, which if you're not familiar with that, the, the government uh, every decade goes through, uh, that stands for Base Realignment and Closure Commission. Um, and they, they assess what bases are still relevant, what are not, what should get scaled down, what should be closed. Um, if, I mean, is PSNS today secure from that? Yes, today, but what about tomorrow? And if we don't keep investments in there and continue to make that a, a stronghold, we do risk that for a future generation. And what would be the consequences to this county? Tremendous, right? But more importantly, What's the, uh, what does that do to our national standing? We are the fifth most trade dependent state in the nation. And to have strong trade, you have to have freedom of the seas. More is globally traded through the oceans, across the oceans, excuse me, than any other form. And if we're not bringing products in through here, and this ties into our ports, guess what? Our agricultural products and other things we produce are not going out from here. And in order to be able to do that, you have to have freedom of the seas, you have to have a strong Navy. And when we look at the threats in the world today, China with its saber rattling on Taiwan, North Korea hell bent on being able to reach the continental US with a ballistic missile, the issues with Israel and, and Gaza, and then you've got the Ukraine issue going on. We're not in a, we are not in a position to be able to really do battle on one front, much less four or five. We've got to make the investments back into our military. We are roughly 50 to 100 ships and submarines behind where we need to be. You don't build those overnight. Those investments need to happen. We need to increase the wages of our shipyard workers. They are woefully behind their peers in other industries. The, uh, it is a struggle to keep workers there because we're also so stretched thin that the amount of work they do they're doing 12 on, 12 off for days on end when they could take a modest pay cut and go work in the civilian sector service industry in this county and have a regular proverbial Monday through Friday, nine to five type of deal. So we're losing those workers. At the same time, what have we done in our education system across this nation? We've, we've gotten rid of the trade skills by and large, right? So those investments need to happen. And again, you look at what China has done on this issue, they have pumped so much money into their civilian shipyards. They are the largest producer of commercial uh, ships now. And what do you do when you go to war? Those shipyards get converted to, to wartime. Those workers are able to work on wartime issues. We are woefully behind on that, and we've got to make that change. We need to do it now. Those, those are the issues I continue to hear about. And again, I know there's a lot of them out there. Um, but. Again, we've got to just communicate with, uh, with our neighbors, hear where they're at, and provide in a way that we can make that happen. And look, come November, whatever happens that night, I can tell you this, I, I'm 90% confident neither party's gonna have some major majority in the US House of Representatives. It's gonna be just the way the, the, the nation is today. 
um, it, we're, we're going to be closely divided for a while, unfortunately, right? Um, but I would love nothing better than that night flip off Fox and go to MSNBC or CNN and watch the Rachel Maddows of the world have to call this district for the Republicans. There's one in Oregon we can flip. There's two or three in California we can flip. To have the, the left coast deliver the majority for the U.S. House of Representatives would be tremendous, and we can get that done. Anyway, here's what it's going to take. One, I need your vote. We have it this August. Okay, don't disregard the primary. It's important to show a strong number. Uh, two, I need, you know, volunteers, you know, whatever capacity that is for you, if you want to host a meet and greet or a fundraiser or go door to door, any of those would be awesome. Put a yard sign out. They're here. Please take one. And then finally, financial support. And I know we're all hammered on this stuff time and time again, but it's just, it's the reality. There's 800,000 people that live in a congressional district, and out of that, four to 500,000 are going to vote. If you're running a business and starting a business and your potential customer base is 400,000, can you reach them without resources? No. And, and, and that's just the reality. It'll take close to a million dollars to remain competitive in this race. Having said that about being competitive, um, a poll, about, it's about a month now. Um, I'm ahead of Emily Randall by nine points. She's ahead of Hillary France by, I forget what it was, eight, I believe. And then there's a whole chunk of undecided voters. And those are the ones we've got to get to. They're the ones that will decide this election, right? And so with your help and your support, we can make that happen. And, you know, Ronald Reagan always talked about the shining city on the hill. And today, a lot of times it feels like that that's not there, right? But we've got to be the positive voice. It's easy to be downtrodden and upset. And I understand it, I do. But we're the ones, we've got to put the smile on our face, be that shining city on the hill. So come November, we can win. And I'll tell you what, coattails go both ways. We can, we can win the governor's race here. We can win this race. We can capture more seats in the state legislature. We can make a world of difference. But it's going to take all of us to get it done. And we can, we can reclaim that shining city on the hill. So with that, I'll look forward to questions. I think that's what we're going to do. And thank you for having me. And uh, let's get this done and let's win this November. Thanks. one for you. When you become a representative, what are your top three priorities that you will address and champion? Well, I kind of hit on those. Um, one, let's, let's touch on the economy because, you know, there's a lot of factors there. I mean, a president and Congress, you know, on a certain level are limited in what they can and can't do. They, I think you can either enhance it or you make it worse. Uh, but one of the biggest things we need to do that affect our economy is write a budget. It's been over 20 years since the federal government's written a budget. And we can actually do continuous resolutions. That's not a that's not a uh, solving the problem. We can't even begin to address the debt and, and, and the deficit until we actually have a structural budget. So that'll be one of the biggest things that uh, that I look forward to doing is working towards actually producing a budget. And I think we need to move to a biennium budget like we do in this state. One of the few things we actually do right in this state structurally is that biennium budget. We do a budget that's for two years. It helps to even out the peaks and the valleys. Um, you can make adjustments to it. Um, but until we get our heads around where we really are spending money, we're not going to be able to get rid of the debt. So there's that. Um, making sure we have our investments in our military, uh, that's, that's a huge part of it. And then the third one, uh, again, dealing with immigration. Uh, hopefully we have a, a president and a Congress that are willing to, uh, to make reforms uh, and, and really address that and secure our border. But I'll also tell you this. And I know this is frustrating for those for us that live in this in a blue state like this and other blue states and cities where they have sanctuary policies. You know how you get rid of it? Same way the federal government made states go to age 21 on drinking. They said if you want federal highway dollars, you will have a drinking age of 21. They did this in the early to mid 80s. Well, I think with the right Congress and the right president, we could say if you want federal funding for anything, you cannot be a sanctuary state. And that would that would go a long way. Talk about where is Washington State the mi where in Washington State is the migrants are problems they are and the problems they are causing. Let me start over. <laughs> Did you get that? Sorry. 
Talk about where in Washington State the migrants are and the problems they are causing. If elected, would you join the Freedom Caucus? So a bunch of questions in there. Um, so we're talking about migrant workers and I, uh, one, there's legal migrant workers, right? And it's a huge necessity for the agriculture industry that we have in Eastern Washington. But we have a visa system that is ineffective and that has got to get reformed. Uh, the reality is um, our, our agriculture industry cannot survive without migrant workers, legal migrant workers. So we've got to get that visa system streamlined to work better for, uh, for the agriculture industry. That's a big part of it. But yeah, we've had, we had a state trooper that died because of uh, an illegal immigrant's actions with a vehicle. Uh, that's unacceptable. And because of executive order by the governor, the state patrol cannot assist um, ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement, with, uh, with border runners. That, that's a big problem, right? And again, that's a state issue, but we can solve that at the federal level, as I mentioned before. And then in terms of the Freedom Caucus, um, I get that question a lot. I don't commit myself to something specifically until I get to know people personally. And I, I don't know if you're aware or not, they, they have to invite you. You don't just get to show up and say, hey, I'm joining. They, they have to invite you to be a member of it. And um, so would I entertain that? Yes, I would, but I want to get to know those people better on a personal level. And that's the same way I've operated in Olympia. Um, so would I entertain it? Yes, but they've got to they've ask. It's not the other way around. Okay, what do you think about the attacks on Semi Bird's character? So here's where we go with, um, how can we divide the party more? I don't care if you support Bird or if you support Riker. Come August and the primary is done, are you going to support the nominee? And if you're not, if we're going to keep asking these questions, we're going to lose. So I'm going to support the nominee. Okay? And, and I, I, it's interesting. So I've got to make, I make 1,200 fundraising calls a week. That's my goal. It, it, again, it goes back to you have to have the resources. And I can't, it's, you're not going to raise it all in Washington. That's the reality of a congressional, or any congressional race. You're not going to raise it all within your state. So you make nationwide calls. I get more questions along that line or about the presidential race from people in Washington state than I do in other states. And what is that? I just, I find that interesting. I'm a little frustrated by it if you can't tell. We get all spun up around the axle about what our Republican neighbor who they're supporting instead of just agreeing that, hey, I support a different Republican and after the primary, we're on the same team. Same from the same sheet of music. And if we don't start doing that, folks, we're gonna lose. This happened in 2012. McKenna lost by 90,000 votes. And there was a block of Eastern Washington voters that said, not conservative enough for me. Yeah. Great, you got 12 years of Inslee, are you happy with that? Yeah. Let's stop this nonsense of dividing ourselves. You put your name on the ballot, you're gonna get attacked. It's the reality of it. Okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Quick way to mute it. And, so I'm not gonna, you know, I, I'm not focused on the governor's race. I'm focused on representing the 800,000 people of this district. I'll make my vote, and I'm gonna support the, the nominee after the primary. What issue is your middle ground to be able to work with the other side? I think, realistically, I think the budget's a big part of that. I really do, because there, there are, um, there are fiscal hawks on the other side of the aisle. They're, um, uh, they're often drowned out. But I, I go back to when I first got elected in Olympia. And at that time, there was a history, or the, the, the method was going into special session after special session after special session to complete our state budget. And at the state level, constitutionally, we have to have a balanced budget. What a novel concept, right? Um, and we and our fiscal year ends June 30th, so you have to have that budget done before July 1st in order to stay functioning. And it, it was the history though of the state legislature that um, to take that right up to the deadline or pretty close to it. And they use it as a as a negotiating tool. Um, and I got in there, I ended up on appropriations, and a colleague on the other side of the aisle, Ruben Carlisle, represents Queen Anne. He and I are probably I wouldn't say 180 degrees apart, but probably 170 degrees apart politically. And I kept bugging him, like, Ruben, come on. Why, we gotta change how we structurally do this. And these are the changes you can make. It's not always about passing a bill. But we got on the same page and okay, let's agree to move the, 
the economic forecast up from March to February. This gets into the schematics of how the whole budget process works, but you rely on this economic forecast to produce the state budget. Well, if we're getting that report in mid to late March, and we're adjourning the second week in April, to write a multi-billion dollar budget is pretty tough in that condensed time frame. And so we moved, we moved it up, and we started looking at that data earlier, and it afforded us the ability to get budgets done. And I, and I bring that up as an example. Get to Washington, find the people that agree that, let's, let's first and foremost agree that we have to have a budget. We're gonna arm wrestle over what that budget looks like, yes. But let's just get to a structural understanding of how it should work. So that'd be one of the biggest ones that I would tackle. And the last one I have here is, how much money is in your war chest now? <laughs> so the uh, fundraising has gone extremely well the past month. Uh, the first quarter was a little tougher with uh, being, uh, being in session, and I made a commitment that I would not forgo my Senate duties um, in running for this office. My opponent missed a lot of votes uh, and did the opposite, which I have a problem with. Um, so we have sufficient resources, and I'm not going to give you the number because I don't know where all that's going to go, and we, we have to publicly disclose that in mid-July. But uh, we've raised uh, well into the six figures, and we're strategically determining how we're going to spend money in the primary. And I would bring this up too. You more than likely will not see something from me in the primary because I hope I have your vote. Right? I've got to get to people that I probably don't. And I think sometimes we get where you'll, you will get bombarded by the two Democrat opponents because they're battling each other. And don't panic that you don't see something from me. There's a reason. We're, we're going after a different segment that um, you know, can vote either way. And they have a tendency to go to a shotgun approach in their, uh, in their spending. So um, I bring that up from that so that, again, don't panic if you're not seeing something from me coming leading into the primary. You will certainly will in the fall, but uh, we're going to be very strategic. Big part of um, how we get uh, uh, boost our numbers is getting low propensity Republicans to vote. Those are people that agree with us on our values and the issues, but they don't regularly vote. And we've got to get those folks to put their ballot in. And I'd ask you this too, vote right away. Because every campaign, and I know there's been this controversy within our party about, oh no, there's, we want to do it at the last minute. No, we don't. Because we, what we do, we have, we have the databases and every campaign has this. We know who by and large is voting our way. And so when the ballots go out, we're going after those people saying, get your ballot in, get your ballot in, get your ballot in. Well, if we have to do that with people that routinely vote Republican and always vote Republican, we're not getting to the people, those low propensity ones. And so we're wasting resources on no one votes instead of being able to go to other ones. And you know, on the whole election issue, folks, we've got to play our game. Jim Walsh has devised a program. Whatever you think about it, harvesting, it's legal in the state. And we're gonna do it. We can't, we can't sit here and bemoan that we lost and that, oh, the other side did this. Well, if it's legal, we're gonna do it. Okay? So if they, you know what, make it a, make it a, a uh, make it a, a social hour, all of you in this club, vote the same day, go march down to the county auditor's office if you don't trust the mail, everybody put it in the box at the same time and then go have cocktails. And make it a big to-do, <laughs> you know? Um, and then we can start working on getting other people to vote. Uh, so that, that's my answer on that one. Again, I apologize, I sound horrible. Uh, it is, this allergy season is killing me, but um, I, do we have any other ones? Is that? All right. So with door knocking, I just became a PCO. I'm excited about it. I'm going to be out doing that in my precinct. And I'm just wondering, as far as do you have literature that as we're doing the door knocking that we can give, can we get that from you or can we get it through the KCRP or where do we get that info? So there's a bunch at the, uh, the, the county uh, party headquarters, um, although I know a lot of it's gone out. So shoot me an email and I'll get you staff and if I'm happy to coordinate that through you. And yeah, if you want to hit doors for me, that'd be awesome. You can do it with, uh, in conjunction with other campaign material too. Um, so yeah, just uh, reach out. We'll make sure that you have the resources to do it. And there's a few on the back table there, not enough to probably go in a doorbell, but um, just let me know. We'll make sure it gets to you. Yeah. Yes. I like what you said about we aren't gonna change the people who are voting for us. Yeah. But we are gonna Everybody has rain 
um, they, I did this and maybe one out of 10 answered the door. It's like, oh, it's great to talk. I'm so glad you're out here and it's great to talk to you. But all, the majority of people don't like it. No. So and I, like what you said, I, you're not gonna change their mind on the doorstep. You can leave them information, but what would you? Yeah, so when I, when I, so again, I think we sometimes make this much more harder than it needs to be. When I personally, as a candidate and as an elected official, go to the door, and I'll tell you, I, I don't like doing it, but I have to, right? So I'm just, so for those of you that don't like it, I get it, because I feel the exact same way. Because <laughs> um, you're right, people do not like people coming to their door, and most of the time they won't answer, and I, I'll leave the deal there. And what I also do, and I'm happy to do this, if a bunch of you are gonna go out, I'll sign them ahead of time. I'll put on there, sorry I missed you, and sign it. It just, it, it's like, oh. It, it's, it's different when you're an elected official, right? You're not, it, 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 it gives you a level of credibility that you know might not be there otherwise. But what I say to somebody that actually answers the door, I just introduce myself, tell them what I'm running for, say I'd appreciate your vote, and I hand it to them. I say, you got any questions? That's it. And you know what? The ones that usually have a question end up are either already committed fully left or fully right because <laughs> they want to know where you are and something, right? The middle ground is like, huh? That's interesting. I'll take a look. Thanks. That's it. I don't go into some diatribe about <laughs> the issues because, yeah, they don't want to hear it. They don't. So, I mean, in my, if you look at my, uh, I use that same piece of literature for going to doors. It's just about me and my background. It's, you know, and, and it hits a couple of the issues that I talked about today. But I keep it pretty benign. Yeah, so the, the ballot boxes we have are state funded, and those are placed throughout the county. I, I can't talk about what other states do, but yeah. the ballot boxes we have, I mean, they're, they're pretty obvious what they look like, right? And then, um, but you can always take it directly to the auditor's office. Um, you can also mail it. Um, and then it turns me to talk about producing other ballots. So yes, anybody, if you get your ballot in the mail and you take it, you know, and you're at home and somehow you inadvertently threw it away and you need a new one, you can actually go online and print it off, print a new one off. And it's going to have the same barcode that's assigned to your voter ID and everything. And you can turn that in and vote it. And what I would encourage everybody to do, once you do vote, you got to give it a couple of days, but go online and you can actually see that's been received and that's been counted or if there's an issue. Yeah, we got to be responsible for our own vote. Whether you like the system we have in this state or not, it's the system we got. We're not going to change it between now and November, okay? So let's let's play by the rules that are in place and take responsibility for our ballot and make sure that it, it gets counted because they, they, how they verify it, they receive it before it's open, they look at that signature, and they, they scan the deal on the top there, it pops up on the screen, shows the signature, they look at it, and if it looks to be the same, then it goes off and then it gets opened and the ballot is separated from your signature. And that's how that happens. So what I'm concerned about is that in Seattle recently there was a councilman race where they were taking in votes on nat nationals supposedly. and other pieces of paper that were not legal ballots and were counted. Well they shouldn't be. And I, I'm not familiar with what that case is, but it has to be on a ballot to be a legal vote, so I have to look at. Okay. But a ballot has to be assigned to the, that individual. It's got to match to their, uh, you can't just randomly print off a ballot and give it to somebody. It's not going to be, because they Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yes, we do. Yep. Chris?
No, by nine points. Yeah, so it was, it was actually her campaign that released it. And I, I thank her for spending the money for me. Because um, so, she released it because she, she wanted to show and articulate that she was ahead of Hillary. Which, put it in their perspective, right? You, that, was, that was her objective in putting that out there. Um, I would have released it differently and just, if, if I had been her, I would have just put out the numbers on her and uh, Hillary and left everything else off. But she didn't. She put the whole thing out. But no, it was a valid poll. It was. Uh, it had a. It had the sample size that's needed to be accurate, and you know, it was with, it had a margin of error calculation. So, yeah, because we were actually getting ready to put one in the field, and then she released it. And we're like, well, okay. saved us ten grand. Thank you. <laughs> so. One more. How far north of Kitsap is the it's the entire Olympic Peninsula. So it's Kitsap, Jefferson, Clallam, Grace Harbor, Mason, Pierce County being the Gig Harbor area, and North Tacoma. But how far up north of Kitsap County? All of Kitsap. All of Kitsap? Yeah. It's the 6th Congressional District. Oh, I was thinking of the 35th. Oh, the 35th goes basically Newberry Hill Road. Exactly. Yeah. 